Let's begin. We'll pray. Father, we thank you for this day, your presence with us, the help you give, the watch, care, the protection. And as we come now to these moments, we ask that you'll give us clarity of thought and openness of heart that we may grasp your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it is time for a quiz. That's <laughs> so, uh, there we are. It's time for a quiz. Just in time for a quiz. <laughs> Not a brain breaker. No, it's it's not, you know. Good, 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 it's a good, good review. We need a little review. Oh, absolutely. It's good for review. We got it about wound up there. I don't know how many are online with us, but uh, do we get to post this thing up? Or? I think so. Yeah, we will. So did it. Those that are online can see it. And do you need a copy that you're going to pass along then, or? Oh, sure. Okay. All right, we're on angels of the invisible world. And uh, here we go with this true, true, false. Uh, angels are eternal, true or false? Huh? Everybody has true. Well, everybody's wrong because they're, they're, they're created beings. Yes, yeah, so they, they're, not, they're not like God without beginning or end. They're created beings, and so they have a beginning, so they're not eternal. But they don't ever end. <laughs> they, well, neither do we. <laughs> All right, number two, angels are spirit beings. We've got that, that's true. Uh, there is a great number of angels, true, false. True, that's true. Four, angels are messengers. Yes, that's uh, exactly the meaning of the word, and it's, Translated that way sometimes. Five, we should worship angels. False. Six, angels serve God's people. <laughs> true, true. Go, go to Acts 12. Oh, they got Peter out of prison. And I thought that angels served God. Well, they serve God's people for, for him, yes. Uh, seven, Demons may possess believers. False. Eight, Satan is an evil influence. False. 
That, that's right. He, he, to make it true, you'd have to make it read, Satan is a person. He's not an influence. He's evil, all right. Nine, believers become angels in heaven. False. Ten, God created Satan. <laughs> but he didn't make Satan evil. No, he didn't create Satan. He created a perfect and good angel. So he did not, God does not, quote, create and create evil. So uh, I, I think the first and the last one were the ones that uh, bothered us the, the most. We forgot on number one that angels were created and therefore not eternal. And, and God didn't make the devil. He created a host of good angels. And, and uh, there we are. Now, last week we were on, we started on the doctrine of man, uh, his origin. We were on page 27 in the outline and uh, that man did not come into existence by a long process of development, evolution in other words, from lower forms of life, but rather came into being as a holy, intelligent, uh, mature person as a result of a direct, and the key word is direct, uh, act of God. Now, it's important, uh, there, admittedly, it takes faith to accept this. It takes faith to accept the word of God. But uh, we, we have to say, too, that it takes faith to accept evolution because you have uh, uh, statements made by people with really no foundation uh, and no observation. I often say that when someone says he believes in evolution, that he has more faith than I do because I don't have enough faith to believe in evolution. I accept the Bible. But I think one thing we have to square away solidly is you cannot hold the biblical position on creation and hold to evolution also. These are two diverse uh, positions and they are eternally <laughs> incompatible. Uh, they, they just will not merge. Therefore, the so-called progressive creationism or theistic evolution is is not a viable option. It's trying to ride two horses at once and it simply does not work because you, you have actually a series of contrasts. Now think about these. The creation of man takes how long? How a moment? <laughs> a moment. Yeah, it's con it's confined to one day. It's the sixth day. It uh, didn't necessarily take 24 hours, but uh, it's within one day. So you have the biblical position is one day, Whereas evolution you have, depending on which evolutionist you're listening to, 
you have millions of years, that this is an extended process that no one really ventures to know how long it takes uh, to, until you get a human, a human being, but it takes a blooming long time. So these two systems of thought are incompatible. You got one day and you got millions of years. Also, in the biblical scheme of things, you start with the complex. The human body is a complex organism and even individual organs within it. For instance, the complexity of the eye is still baffling. And the medical scientists say they practice medicine. It's a, a science, but not a hard science uh, like math. And uh, everyone who uh, takes uh, uh, zoology or, or anatomy and physiology uh, knows that uh, when you open up a, a body, uh, that things, certain things are supposed to be in there and they're supposed to be in a certain place. But they're never quite like the diagrams in the book. It's, you know, you never know till you, you get in there. I, recently, there was someone who was supposed to have a relatively simple operation. And uh, it took four hours. Uh, they didn't know what they're going to run into until they, they got inside, is the story. Yes, question. On the, uh, on the end of, uh, or towards the end of Genesis 1, we have the God created in his own image, image of uh, God. He created him male and female. He created them prior to the Adam's rib um, story of Eve. Are we... Uh, is that really more about higher up, about how creation is set up as males and females as opposed to Adam and Eve? Let, let's back up. Gen take Genesis 1 as a paragraph. Verse 1 as the topic sentence. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That, that's the whole story. It, that's everything. But now we're going to get the detail. This is done in six days. And this is the unpacking of the topic sentence, which a paragraph does. Now, in the sixth day, you are told, uh, verse 27, God made man in his image, male and female created he them. Uh, that's just the broad, inclusive statement. Now you come to chapter 2, and you get the unpacking of that. That the, the male is created from verse 7 of the dust of the ground. And the female is not created the same way. She is from a piece of, both are from existing material, uh, but she, she is from the uh, uh, rib of, of Adam. So what you get is just further, further detail. That's all. That's all. Now, uh, so we're, we're saying that... Uh, The two systems, evolution and biblical creation, are incompatible and cannot be merged, as is supposedly done in theistic evolution. Because it takes one day with one, and it's taking uh, with the other millions of years. The next is... With the biblical scheme of things, you're starting out with the complex. Uh, everyone understands that a human being 
uh, is different from all other creatures and capable of doing things that are far beyond the capability of others and the tricks that animals do they have been trained to do by human beings. A trained horse does not train another horse, you know. And, and uh, it takes uh, human intervention. In the evolutionary scheme of things, you do not start with the complex, but with simple. the simple. You start with a one-celled creature, an amoeba, and then you get a multi-celled creature and millions of years you finally get uh, animal creatures and amphibians and slowly it slowly it moves so they're just the reverse you're starting uh, biblically with a complex uh, organism you're starting with a very simple one in evolution furthermore uh, in the Bible scheme of things, you have, and we'll get more to this, retrogression. In other words, there is not a human being alive today who had the physique and health and stamina of Adam. That's been lost. There's not a human being alive who has the intellectual capacity of Adam. Uh, so in the biblical scheme of things, you got, and we'll get there, the fall. In other words, we're going downhill. There's a downward trend. In evolution, what is the trend? Upward. Upward. It's progress, retrogression, biblically. Uh, what about with evolution? Don't you have like isn't well, death like necessarily part of it? So you'd have death before sin. God uses it to make. Yes, th this this is a problem. Yeah, you know, that uh, with, with evolution, that uh, you have creatures dying and. Uh, 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 but uh, you remember, be, be fair, a thoroughgoing evolutionist was really an atheist, whether he admits it or not. So he's not a Bible believer, and he's not concerned about sin. See, that's uh, uh, morally, he, they're, they're just social mores. There's not uh, sin and a standard of right and wrong. So in evolution, in creation, you have retrogression. In evolution, you have progress. And in the Bible scheme of things, you have containment. Everything reproduces, what's the Bible phrase? After its kind, after its kind, after its kind, you know. Well, well, species is a term belong to biological science in that branch called taxonomy. And, and there is not agreement among the taxonomists exactly on what is a species. So I've always sort of backed off uh, and don't like to use the word species because I don't know who I'm talking to and what his definition is of a species. But one thing you never want to do is to equate kind with species. That can get you into a swamp that you, where you don't want to go. Uh, because after its kind, from dogs you get dogs, from birds you get birds, and so on. You, you, you don't get eagles from chickens, you know. And everything is, is after, after its, its containment. But the very heart of evolution is derivation. You, you get different kinds of things out of what you have already. So the two aren't compatible there. 
And then with the Bible plan, it's, it's completed. Uh, we're not getting new kinds of creatures. Uh, you, you get different breeds of dogs, but they're still dogs. Uh, but you're not getting different kinds of creatures. Uh, and in evolution, you have uh, a continuing uh, or a continuum. You're, you're getting different kinds of creatures. You start with an amoeba, and pretty soon you have some other kind of creature, and, and on it goes till you finally get a human being somewhere along the line. Biblically, everything's completed. When, when Genesis 1 closes, you got the whole picture. And it's been that way ever since. Uh, so on all these other things, we can, we can uh, ask questions. Why do we still have an amoeba? What happened to him? Didn't he evolve? You know, did he get left behind? What, what took place? And... Uh, if there's all this progress, uh, people aren't living as long as they once did, so even with medical science. So there's a problem there, obviously. And uh, th then uh, we're, we're not, uh, we ought to be getting new kinds of creatures, uh, evolution, evolution thinking. But we're not. We're still on the same track. So we're on page at the bottom of 27, the nature of man, the nature of man. It's important to find out who you are, you know. Uh, I, I, and I, I think that uh, what you have to mark down, uh, we've got it here is there are basically two parts to a human being. There's the physical part. We all have bodies. And, but then we realize there's something, uh, something more than the body also. And there we come with different names. We, we talk about the heart as, as a opposed to the physical heart. Have, somebody says, have a heart, you know, by which he does not mean the physical organ. And we talk about the soul and so on. And to get this straightened out is very important. Now, among Christian people, there are two different positions. And it's up to your choice, I guess, what you want to take. There are, and the, the Bible, of course, uses a, an array of terms uh, for the metaphysical, the non-physical uh, part of a human being. You are either a trichotomist or a dichotomist. If you're a trichotomist, Catamist, you believe that man has a body, a soul, and a spirit. You make a distinction between the soul and the spirit. If you're a dichotomist, you just believe that the soul and the spirit are just different labels for the spiritual or non-material part of you. I think the important truth to grasp with this is that your body is not you. We're all to an extent materialists, you know, what, what we can see, touch, uh, is real to us. But uh, your body is your house. Uh, it's called this tabernacle and so on that you live in. The body is the house you live in. It houses you. And you are inside of this. 
you're confined. You you can't you can't leave. You know that's just the the way it is. And we're come down to death then, and defining death as separation. Death is nothing but you leaving your body. When you leave your body, you're dead. Now, uh, legally, you're not dead until uh, a physician pronounces you dead. And in our society, there's a, a certificate of death, a death certificate. And by the way, just a little extra free information. If somebody dies in your family, the undertaker's going to ask you how many death certificates you want. It's more than you think. You need a handful of them, one or two. Is every time you turn around, somebody's asking you for a death certificate. You get 10 or 12, and that, that may cover it. It may not, but it's not one or two. Hear me. And you get them, of course, the undertaker will supply them to you. It's a slight fee for it, but uh, otherwise you're chasing back to get some more of them. So legally, uh, that's what death is. But actually, I, I'm, I'm thinking of one of our dear ladies. Uh, she was a prayer partner years back of my wife. And she just dropped on the living room floor. Well, they do, you know, they call 911 and they carted her off to the hospital and they had a big hospital bill, but they were, they left with a corpse. I mean, she had died right there on the, uh, on the living room floor and that was it. And you were a stewardess and nobody dies on airplanes. So rest in comfort. You, yes, yes. You, <laughs> Yeah, there's a bl there's a blanket. There are just too many legal problems with people dying on airplanes, and so they, you know, just in case you do, you didn't remember. <laughs> that's that's the the way it goes, and uh, so. Uh, but when you leave your body, that's it. The body is not functioning anymore. Well, let's go down our list. We're opening our Bibles here now to Genesis. Yes, question. Maybe you're going to get to it then. So then how does a trichotomist distinguish between the soul and the spirit? Oh, I'm sorry. I should have touched on that. The, the, the soul, the, the trichotomist would say that the soul is, is the mind and the natural functioning of the person. The spirit is that which uh, communicates with God. That's God word. The, the soul functions horizontally. The spirit functions vertically. This is you, you pray with your spirit, not with your soul, and so on. Uh, my position is basically, I guess I'm a dichotomist, that you have different aspects of this immaterial part of you and uh, with different labels, but they're not, not distinct. It's, you're, you're functioning in different ways, and there aren't uh, somehow, and of course it's all um, not physical anyway, so how do you divide something that's not physical? I, I, I do not know. But you know, trichotomy and dichotomy, this is not something that you, uh, have a breach of fellowship over. It's not something you start a new denomination on or something like that. It's just a matter of someone's position. Question. So on the, uh, <clears throat> uh, on the soul, the soul would not be eternal either. No, no. It's immortal. Well, it's immortal. That's a good way of but not eternal. Because by immortal, we mean it does not die. die. Because it's the, the body is destructible. Uh, Luther, and next year is the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, 
which the Lutherans and some others will really celebrate. But Luther was rather corpulent. Uh, he uh, put away a lot of that heavy German food. And uh, when uh, rebuked for it, his response was, the more for the worms to feast on. <laughs> and uh, so it didn't bother him very much, I guess. But uh, the body will go. And uh, it's interesting, you know, some um, salesman-type funeral director, this casket seals so that nothing can get in it, you know. Uh, <laughs> the corruption is in it. It's not going in it from some place. It's the body is... Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, corruptible. That means it rots. It decomposes. And, of course, that's the reason for embalming, to uh, removing all the blood from the system and, and putting in formaldehyde to do a little uh, preserving. The Egyptians, by the way, did pretty well. They had a whole system that would not work in Chicago because the climate is different here. But they removed all the internal organs and uh, those went in separate jars, the heart, the lungs, and uh, intestines, and the rest of it. And uh, then wrapped the other, and in that dry climate, uh, the, the rest uh, was, would uh, sort of uh, petrify, and you get these mummies that you see in the museums. But uh, that is only after the funeral people did their procedure on those corpses. Well, we're looking at 219 here. Uh, interesting. Uh, and now... Out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever man called every living creature, that was its name. So you have all these creatures parading before Adam to get their ID. And... I have never, I, I, I don't know whether such exists, but I have never met nor heard of a person who had the name for all the living creatures. I had a rather stiff course in zoology, but my professor did not know the names of all the, the, <coughs> the living creatures. And which means Adam had an intellect that was functioning at a very high level. Not only did he give names to all of them, uh, but he knew them, of course, and we, we try to remember them. So he has an intellect. Uh, he has sensibility. Look at uh, 3, 7 here. In Genesis we are... And the eyes of them both were opened, and they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together for themselves, it says. And look at verse 20. Uh, she's, his wife's name, Eve. She's the mother of all living. There are feelings and emotions. Look at 2, 8. Back to 2.8, uh, there's a garden planted, and he's able to handle this. 2.18, the Lord God says, it's not good for man to be alone. I'll make a helper. It's, this is amazing. Adam was smarter than the evolutionists because after he looks over all these animals and uh, he, 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 there's no one for him 
he, loneliness is a feeling that everybody has experienced to some degree or other at a time. Uh, if you're in a strange place, surrounded by strange people, uh, you begin to get this, this feeling that uh, I think the worst I ever had was when I was in Seoul, Korea. I get along pretty well in Europe and can find my way around and so on. But I got in Seoul, Korea. I could not make out one sign. I could not communicate with anybody. You, you know, you, you, you're a bit overwhelmed at that point. So Adam has feelings, he has sensibility. And you go to chapter 2, verse 15, and, and through 17 here. The Lord God, chapter 2, took man, put him in the garden to work. The Lord God commanded, saying, you may eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not make which means he had the ability to what? Choose. Choose. He had volitional power. He had a will. So, and this is what we mean when we say that man is made in the image of God. Now, there are some people, the Mormons and some others, who fall into this pit of taking... Uh, Genesis 1, 26, let us make man in our image, that it's physical. Well, now, no. The image of God in the, and, and then, of course, there's a wide variation among the appearance of people. So which, which one are you talking about? I mean, a very wide uh, difference. So when we come to Adam, he's made in the image of God in the sense he has a, an intellect. He can think. He has emotions. He can feel. He has a will. He can choose. These are what is meant by the image of, of God. Uh, and so he has a sense of he can choose or not to choose. Question. The um, more of a point that I just want to ask you about. There are two not three notables here. If you're, you made me think quite a bit about the uh, the more superior body. I'll put it that way. Prior to the fall. Oh yes. That being said, there really isn't a that his body is not at the moment we're born we're degrading. Adam is not. Adam is fully alive. Correct. And he's not mortal. He's immortal. He's immortal at the prior to the fall. That's right. That's important to me. Okay, that helps me a lot. He, that. he cannot die. At, but what, what, what I'm confused about is he, God gives him the, the knowledge, gives, tells him not to eat of the tree of life, of knowledge, prior to... Eve coming. So Eve actually never hears those words. So Adam... You don't think she knew them? I would, I would guess that he was older. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. We have no biblical... Uh, yes. And, and I, I think something that is hard to get fastened in our minds, that Adam never grew up. He was never an infant a child, a teen. He uh, was created at the uh, exact uh, ideal, whatever it is, level of maturity, uh, which means you got to date his age, not from a birth, he didn't have any, but you date it from creation. And uh, that he is perfect 
physically, and he is perfect mentally, which means he has indescribable uh, intellectual capacity, which would uh, make us envious and would intimidate us. And, of course, he is immortal, uh, which means he cannot die. Oh, he's losing everything. It, it, it's just a, a, a big, it's exactly that. It's a fall, it's retrogression, it's downhill, it's loss, and indescribable, indescribable loss. Now, uh, look at 3.8. Uh, start with 7. After they sinned, the eyes of both were opened and they knew they were naked. It was of agreeable climate. Clothes were not necessary. <coughs> and they sewed these fig leaves together. There comes a sense of shame. And uh, they heard the sound of God. And verse 8, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. They knew they had done evil. They, there's a sense of right and wrong. Now, that has been woefully distorted, of course, after the fall. And uh, <clears throat> it can be a person can feel he's done wrong when he hasn't because the conscience uh, is malfunctioning. And he can do do wrong and not feel bad about it. Uh, you look at the corruption uh, that we see at various levels of government and the lying to cover it up. And these people sleep at night, you know. <laughs> and you, you, you'd think they couldn't go to sleep. No, the, the conscience has been uh, Paul talks about uh, seared with a hot iron. In other words, it's damaged. The conscience is damaged. But when we talk about the image of God, these are the things we're talking about. Intellect, emotions, will, intellectual power, uh, emotional fe feelings, uh, volitional power, the will, the conscience, these are the things that are, are functioning within a human being. And this is you. You have intellect. You have emotions. You have will. And uh, turn to, uh, with me, Second Corinthians chapter... Chapter 7, uh, first, uh, first Corinthians 5 is what I'm after. First Corinthians, no, second, I'm sorry, second Corinthians 5. We'll hit this yet. We'll hit this yet. 2 Corinthians 5, for we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, he's speaking of what? What? The body. Why does he use the figure tent? Temporary, yeah. Temporary, you know, very, very temporary. Any house is temporary, but the tent is super temporary. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. In other words, he speaks. In this tent, we do groan, verse 2, and uh, by putting it off, we may not be found naked. And, and so that the, the moment you leave your body, the, the death, the 
definition of death, any kind of death, is the word separation. The, you are separated. The soul is separated from the body. When you vacate the premises, that's it. And in spite of all the other things, you, you know, you, your grandfather dies, you go to the funeral home, the funeral director of Nietzsche and says, well, your grandfather is in parlor B. Well, he's not there. He is not there. And uh, I, I think to have a clear understanding of who you are and what your body is and that you live in it uh, helps us practically in life and uh, gets uh, rid of a lot of mental cobwebs. And we, we clearly understand now. Uh, the body even is to be respected. You just don't throw it out with the garbage, you know. It's civilized people and Christian people have often, have always had a respect because it, it was, you know, your tabernacle, your tent for X number of years. And and we identify persons with their bodies. We talk about a picture ID, which we all have, I presume. And uh, so the face is, is you, but it's not you. You're inside there someplace. So, and you don't identify this with the brain. This is important. And uh, because you, you have life apart from that. The, the brain is physical. You are a non-physical entity. So the nature of man. We're moving on from here next week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness and help. And we thank you for these moments Help us to understand your word and to follow it, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.